Good morning, church. That was a, a very special <laughs> time in worship for me. Uh, that song, Jesus Be the Center, was actually one of the main songs we sang at our wedding. And so for me, it always very emotional moment. <laughs> when one looks back, one looks over the time that the Lord has walked with me. I got saved around 2011. Radical, young man, left everything to follow Jesus. And God provided every step of the way. Was fortunate enough to get married in 2020 when the world was going crazy, falling apart. God was busy building my life. And it's, it's just, it, it was a special moment and none of this is in my notes. <laughs> but may we never lose sight of how special it is to walk with Jesus. May we never lose sight of that. Let me try to get back to my notes. Good morning, beautiful bride of Christ. That's how I started it. Be beautiful bride of Christ. How are you this morning? How are you? Good? How are you? Are you good? Are you good? Have you been reading the marvelous word of the living God? Have you been obeying the voice of God? seems like this morning is the morning of testimonies. I want to quickly, before I get into the word, I want to share a testimony of my week with you. Um, this week I was very fortunate enough uh, to be able to go to a pastor's workshop. So the school gave me, um, they allowed me to take leave, and it wasn't just any leave. As teachers, we don't have a lot of leave because of school holidays, but they allowed me to take special study leave for this workshop. And, and that for me is a testimony in and of itself. But what happened at this workshop was what, it's a whole bunch of pastors from all different denominations. We get together and we prepare sermon notes, worksheets. And then you submit your worksheet to nine other pastors and they destroy your sermon. They take it apart. They, oh, it is absolutely brutal. It's a truly humbling experience. However, the, the testimony, and it's two part, the first part is we need to give glory to God. That at a workshop like this, we have about more than 30 men of God who are dedicating themselves to preaching faithfully. That should excite you as, as the body of Christ. We've got pastors all over our province who want to preach more faithfully, who want to do better. But this is the really exciting part, is that attending this training, they've given us access to lessons. And one of these courses for a single course is valued at $19. And they've, it's about 11 courses. And this workshop has given us all the course material for free. Absolutely for free. And what's even better is they told me I'm allowed to share. So it's not just for me. So guys, be on the lookout. I'm going to be sharing very soon with you some real, real amazing things that can really help you in your study of the Bible. So that value works out at just over 4,000 Rand, and that's for free. So guys, we have so much to be thankful for. Not only are we hearing of Ray recovering and going from strength to strength, and yes, the road is still ahead, but we honor God that he is with him, alongside him. But he is also equipping CBC, CBC, Centurion Baptist Church, is being equipped. Surely we should praise the Lord. We are marching on. We are moving forward. Let us open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, I give you all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory. The gospel we have is a gospel of peace. 
the gospel we have is a gospel of freedom. And Father, it is a gospel you have given us. Lord, we give you all the honor and all the praise as we think of Ray, as we think of Kurs, as we think of many others who are praying over different, different difficulties in their life. But Father, I pray that you fix our eyes upon Jesus Christ. Help us to fix our eyes on the only one who can satisfy our need. You are the provider. You are the healer. You are the great I am. But Father, help us to exalt you and not your miracles, to worship you and not what you can do. Lord, as we come to your word now, I pray that, Holy Spirit, you meet every single one where they are at. You convict and you encourage and you guide the hearts to a sanctification in the truth. We ask this in your mighty name. Amen. So far this year, we've been working through the Gospel of Luke. And as I was preparing, the Lord laid it very clearly on my heart to ask you a very specific question. What have you put into practice so far from the Gospel of Luke? How has the Bible changed the way in which you are living? Now, we've been doing this from about Christmas last year. Has the Word of God made an impact in your life? Or are you perhaps still living off the word that God spoke to you 10 years ago? I want you to think about that. We describe our faith as a relationship with God. And so the question I'm asking you this morning is very simple. How is your relationship going with God? We're hearing the word. We, we're in the Word, we're in the Gospel of Luke, but how is your relationship going with God? And so the title of this morning's message is Relationship. Relationship. I want you to turn in your Bible with me to the Gospel of Mark. This morning we're jumping to the Gospel of Mark and we are in chapter 8. And I want you to remember and keep in mind the question, how is your relationship with God. If you are in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 34. Mark, chapter 8, from verse 34. And this is what it says. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up, the, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. My first point is this, deny yourself. The question is, how is your relationship going with God? Deny yourself. If you have a glance at this text, if you just quickly look at the verses just before 34, from 27 to 33, if you look at that story just before our passage this morning, you would have noticed Peter, the great Peter, goes from hero to zero. He goes from declaring that Jesus is the Christ. He declares Jesus is the Christ in verse 29. And then very quickly, Jesus says to Peter, that same Peter, a few verses on, get behind me, Satan. He goes from saying, you are the Christ, to being rebuked. Understand clearly this morning, 
that Jesus says this to Peter because he did not understand how this promised Messiah must suffer and die. In the, in the verses just before, at from 31 to 32, Jesus explains very clearly, the, the Bible says, um, he tells this plainly in verse 32. He makes it very clear to Peter and them that Jesus must die and rise again. But for Peter, he understands Jesus is the Christ. This is the Messiah, the coming King. He's going to restore Israel. How can this happen to him? And because Peter doesn't understand the plan of God, worse than that, Peter refuses to submit to the will of God. Jesus rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan. Because Peter wanted it to be this victorious king, this glorified Jesus. My question this morning is, are we perhaps the same? Do we want God to make things happen the way we see fit? You see, Peter understood that Jesus was the Christ, but he also understood the Christ will be the victorious king. And Peter wanted to happen on his terms, in his life. Must God fit into our plans? My first point is deny yourself. That's what we see in the text. You see, Mark 8 verse 34 to 38 tells us that this is how our relationship with God must look like. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. Let's not beat around the bush this morning. The text says, follow Christ to the point of death. When he says pick up your cross, it's not a metaphor. Death was a very real experience to this first audience. Jesus is not saying pick up your burden. He is saying follow me to death. The text says this morning from 34 to 38 that we are to follow Christ to the point of death. What the cross symbolizes is even to the point of being tortured to death. Is your comfort your priority or is obedience to God's word your priority? As I said, we've been journeying through the Gospel of Luke up to now, and the question we have to ask ourselves is, has that journey changed my life? It's the word of the living God. If it's not changing our life, we have to come back to this fundamental question and ask ourselves, are we denying ourselves? Isaiah says that the word always returns to him successful. Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20 says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. How is your relationship with God going. Is that just the great commission that you know of but doesn't change your life? Doesn't change your action? Deny yourself. It's the first test that we have of, of testing our relationship with God. Are we denying ourselves? But I want, to, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews in chapter 6, I'll be reading from uh, the end of chapter 5, from verse 11. And what I want you to see in Hebrews is, here we're going to see something about spiritual maturity, about growing in the faith. The question again is, how is your relationship with God going? How are you doing when it comes to God? And first we see that the relationship the picture of a relationship with God is to deny ourselves and to follow Jesus. Read with me from verse 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 11. From verse 11, it says this. About this, we have much to say. 
And it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk and not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on, on, on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgments. And this we will do if God permits. What is the book of Hebrews saying to us? What is this all about? You see, the, the, gospel, the book of Hebrews, the, one of the main emphasis is in Hebrews is that Jesus Christ is superior. And, and Hebrews begins with saying that Jesus Christ is superior to the angels, then it moves on to he's superior to Moses. And, and, and this passage that we've read, the author is busy making the point that Jesus is superior to all other priests. And in the immediate context before our passage, the author is explaining that, that Jesus is a priest of the order of Melchizedek. But what we see here and where we picked up the scripture is the author's frustrated with these believers because he's trying to explain this, this concept about Melchizedek, which is an obscure priest in the Old Testament. He has no beginning, he has no end. How does he fit in? And this author is getting frustrated because instead of being able to discuss this in detail, his audience are spiritually lazy and dull of hearing. You see, if we look at chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, these are the basics. These are the basics of our faith. It is the repentance. It is faith towards God. It is instruction in, in washings, which is a reference to baptism. It's laying on of hands. It's the resurrection of the dead. It's eternal judgment. Those are the basics. Are we still at a point where we're only focusing on the basics? We cannot be walking with God for 20 years and still remain struggling with these doctrines. You cannot be journeying with God for 10 years and still not understand that it is by grace you are saved through faith. It's not saying these doctrines are important. These doctrines are important and we must get them right. But they are foundational. And I want to, I want to point your attention. Notice verse 14 of chapter 5. 14 of chapter 5 actually tells us a key characteristic of the spiritually mature. You see in, four, in verse 14... The mature Christian is described as one who can discern or tell the difference between what is good and what is evil. A mature Christian can tell the difference between what is good and what, of, and what is evil. How many of us still cannot tell the difference between what is good for the Spirit and what is bad for the Spirit? How many of us choose rather to ignore spiritual discernment because of a lack of knowledge or understanding of those things? Sort of if someone says, oh, that's a spiritual thing, we're sort of like, oh, I'll ask my pastor. We are called to maturity. We are called to maturity. 6 verse 1 says, let us leave the basic, the foundational doctrines and go on to maturity. Two weeks ago I said this, I said the only doctrine worth knowing and learning is doctrine contained in the pages of the Holy Bible. Study the Bible. That remains true this morning. You see, the Bible is all you need 
to be able to become spiritually mature. The Bible is all you need to be able to discern the spiritual things, to discern between good and evil. Look at verse 14 again of chapter 5. You see, this discernment, this ability to distinguish is something that must be trained, in verse 14, it must be trained by constant practice. Are you practicing your discernment or do you still want to talk about the basic doctrines of our faith? It's quite a practical verse, isn't it? It's quite a verse that engages us in everyday living. You see, this week, as I said earlier, I was at a, at a training, a place where I was training my skills in preaching. But you know what made it so much more effective? I wasn't training alone. You see, I was training, but I was surrounded by fellow believers, by fellow pastors. But it was actually very uncomfortable. Uh, my wife will attest, the one night I only got to bed at quarter to one, because Tuesday I got there, I did well, and then I had to redo all my notes because I realized I was way off. And even after redoing all my notes, presenting my sermon, I'd still missed it. I had still so much more to learn. It was uncomfortable. It required humility. It required an openness from my part to allow another pastor to tell me I'm wrong. Are we open to our brothers and sisters to confront us? With the, especially the second sermon notes that I submitted, I'd actually still disagree with the feedback. They took, tore me apart, they told me I'm wrong. I disagreed with the criticism, but I still learned from the criticism. I still submitted to them that I see that what they are saying has value. It was an open conversation, it was a mutual submission. The same is true for our spiritual maturity. How much more can we improve the skill of discernment between right and wrong if we allow our brothers and sisters in Christ the opportunity to confront us? If we allow brothers and sisters in Christ to confront us when they think we are wrong, we give ourselves the opportunity to practice the skill of discernment. Remember, this is not about ultimately what is right and wrong. God is the judge. God is the one who knows. And God is the one who leads. But we need to practice this discernment. And we're going to get to uh, 1 Corinthians after that, uh, after this point, where I'm going to expand a bit on that. But I want you to understand that your spiritual maturity needs to be practiced. And this will result in times of being uncomfortable. This will even result in times that are painful. But we need to be constantly practicing our discernment. My greatest fear is that I fear that we have tolerated too much sin, that we have tolerated too much evil. If you look at some of the letters written to the churches in Revelations chapter 2 and 3, what you notice is that the failing of some of those churches was because they grew dull and tolerant of evil. It's not that their doctrine was wrong. It was they had tolerated evil. A mature Christian is one who is constantly practicing discernment of what is good and evil. Are you open to correction? Are you willing to discern the things in your life that are good? Are you willing to discern the things in your life that are evil? Or are you perhaps simply living without discernment, without a careful thought to what is spiritual? Are you simply going on? My first point is deny yourself. My second point is actively discern good and evil in your life. Remember, the question is, how is your relationship with God going? How's it going with God? 
Are you discerning? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 12. And I'm going to read till verse 20. Again, you can do a whole study from chapter 6 to chapter 9, and you'll see much fruit regarding spiritual maturity. But let's read chapter 6 from verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both, one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never! Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And now Paul comes back to the point in 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God. I want you to listen to the next part. You are not your own. For you were bought with a price. So, glorify God in your body. Galatians 5 verse 1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Self-control, self-restraint, and self-discipline bear much greater fruit than selfishness, pride, and self-focus. I was going to do self-esteem instead of pride, but there is positive self-esteem. But the point I'm making is that a denying of yourself is what is meant by self-control, self-restraint, and self-discipline. This is where you grow in spiritual maturity. Yes, you are free to do all things. All things are lawful f for you, but not everything is helpful. All things are lawful for you. There's no judgments here. But do not be dominated by anything. Why? The text goes on in Corinthians because the body is for the Lord and we are called to glorify God in our bodies, in our actions. I want you to notice how this passage in Corinthians says that all things are lawful or allowed. Discernment is saying, okay, I, I'm, I'm free, but what should I do? That is the function of discernment. This is what it means to discern between good and evil. You see, as a child of God, you have to continually practice between distinguishing between what is helpful and what is not helpful in your relationship with Christ. Let me tell you a short story about two men, Joe and Frank. There's a podcast I listen to that retells stories of the Bible, and they often say, none of the names in the stories have been changed because none of them were innocent. But this is just a, gener a generic Joe and Frank. Now, Joe grow grew up in a staunch Christian home, and he was taught from very young that, that bacon is evil, and it corrupts good character. You see, Joe was trained that bacon is the food of gluttons. It is, it's a food of the people who seek only their own satisfaction and only satisfying their own appetites. 
And Job, being a good Christian boy, he honored his parents, and so his whole life, he never ever ate bacon. And yet this anti-bacon stance dominated his thoughts. He elevated his stance on bacon to a point where it was no longer about glorifying God, but it was all about whether or not there was bacon. Frank, he grew up under no such instruction, and bacon was commonly found at special occasions. And however, Frank, as he grew up, he realized that bacon really caused an issue for some of his friends. And so Frank got to a point where he decided he will never eat bacon again. He never thought of it again. Life simply continued without bacon. Here's my question. Who glorified God? Both men chose not to eat bacon. One was free. The other was not. It's a bit of a silly story. But we can replace bacon in the story with our traditions. We can replace bacon with our style of worship. We could replace bacon with our eating habits or whatever else. Sadly, most of us are like Joe, where we try to give up something, but we end up simply obsessing on everything else when simply we should focus on God. You see, the goal, the point of maturity is to glorify God. It's quite simple, really. Look at the end of this passage in Corinthians. It says, so glorify God in your body. But just before that, the emphasis Paul is making is you are not your own. You are bought with a price. Do not think that your life is yours to live as a born again believer. Your life is not yours to live. Your life is to demonstrate the glory of God. You are not your own. Christ laid down his life as a ransom for yours. You, dead in your sin, were bought with a costly price. The question this morning... How is your relationship with God going? My first point was that we are to deny ourselves. Stop advocating for your rights, for your life, for your, your, your. And start denying yourself. My second point was this, discern between good and evil. Stop tolerating sin, evil, and wickedness in your life. Politeness to sin and evil is not a testimony of God's grace. It is a denial of His grace. I want to say that again. Being polite, a politeness to sin and evil is not a testimony of God's grace. Jesus wasn't polite to sin as He hung on the cross. He wasn't kind to sin. Scripture tells us to put to death the flesh, the carnal, the sinful nature. It is a denial of His grace to tolerate sin. And so constantly practice discernment between good and evil and choose good. I could quote Deuteronomy after the the law was given to the Israelites. Deuteronomy ends with this. It says, before I put before you the choice between life and death, And then God continues that and says, choose life. The same goes for discernment. Discern between good and evil, but then choose good. And my final point is this. Jesus' blood is precious. And you were bought with the most precious blood of Jesus Christ. Stop minimizing the beauty, the value, and the grace of his blood through thinking that you are doing God a favor by coming to church. Rather glorify God in and through and with your body.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you made the way for us. You initiated this relationship and you restored us to right relationship with you through Jesus Christ. But Father, I pray that this morning we take a moment to think again, to look again and to ask ourselves this very simple question of how is my relationship going with you? Father, convict us for where we have walked away from you. Encourage us, Lord, for where we are coming back to you. Help us, Father, to bring you glory and honor. And Lord, I just want to give you all the honor and praise that you never turn away a single soul that comes to you. May we come to you and, and go again. Encourage your people this morning. In your name, amen. We're going to shift over now to communion. I'm going to begin this morning reading from the Gospel of Matthew. And this is when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. Matthew 26, verse 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And it was at this moment, just before Jesus was betrayed, sent to die, that he institutes something very special amongst the followers of Jesus Christ. He took, he took the bread, which symbolizes his body, and his body took on punishment for you, for me. Jesus shed his blood on that cross, and Matthew says it here beautifully, it is the blood of the covenant. It's a promise God makes with us as his people that he will forgive our sins. And he said it is poured out for the forgiveness of his sins in verse 28. And so this morning, after what we've heard about our relationship, I want you to really think about it. This communion meal is a very personal moment between you and your Savior. It's a, re it's a reminder, a remembering of what he did for you. And we know that yes, he saved us, but we have so many other testimonies of what he's done since, how faithful he has been. Let us come back to him with a heart of worship, with a devotion again to what it really is. What is the gospel? What is the great commission? What is the basics of our faith? Are we doing that? Jesus, he took the bread and he broke it. When he broke it, in Peter it says, by your stripes we are healed. He physically went through that to give us healing, both spiritual and physical. When he took and shared the cup, he shared the cup with Judas. He even shared the cup with the one who would betray him. Never think for a moment God will turn you away. But come to him in repentance. Come to him again. I'm going to ask Anton if you can pray over the bread. Father, what can we say but... <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you that you sent your son. Father, we in our sin can do nothing without you. And let us always remember what you did for us and 
We pray that you, as we eat this bread, that we always remember your loving kindness, your goodness, your mercy. Father, and help us to to love you more and to to glorify you, whatever we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'm going to ask for Len to just pray over the cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for coming in once in your presence. We pray, Lord, for your sacrifice. There's no amount of words that can measure what you have done for us, Lord. But the only way we can is live our lives according to your word that you've taught us, Lord. May we have attentive hearts, attentive minds, Lord, not just for this moment, Lord, but knowing that you are every step of the way in our daily lives. And we just want to thank you, Lord, for, for what you've done for us, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you that we do not earn our salvation, but it is something you have already accomplished. On the tree, on that cross, you declared that it is finished. Lord, I pray that you help us to enter into your rest. And so I pray this benediction over your people. Lord, I pray that you'll keep them from stumbling, that you'll present them to yourself blameless before your presence of your glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen.